I was a young engineer living in a small town in central Massachusetts, I loved to walk into town center to pick up groceries and go to the post office. On the way, there was a body shop. And I got to know the owner and would stop and talk. One day, he pointed to all the wrecked cars in his lot and said, do you know how many of these cars have car phones? Now, that was back before cell phones, when rich people had car phones. Half. I nodded. He just shook his head. Do you know how many cars on the road have car phones? Then it hit me. <clears throat> Nowhere near half. He just shook his head. No way am I putting one of those contraptions in any of my trucks. In 2017, 5,147 Americans died on the job. Not around 5,000. 5,147 workers died, leaving behind people who loved them. If we're going to do something to reduce the number of people who work on the job, who die on the job, we've got to understand how they die. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports every December on the fatalities for the prior year. The BLS also talks about the six major causes of workplace fatalities. The sixth accounting for about 2 to 4% of all workplace fatalities is fires and explosions. The fifth, accounting for about 7 to 10%, is exposure to harmful substances and environments. I'm a process safety engineer. My job is to tackle fires, explosions, and toxic releases. But altogether, they account for less than 12% of all workplace fatalities. Sometimes I wonder if I'm working on the right thing. Slips, trips, and falls as a category was a distant fourth in 1992 when the BLS started reporting this data. It has since climbed pretty steadily and is now accounting for about 17% of all workplace fatalities. By 2017, it had reached second. 2017 is also the year that OSHA put in place new regulations for fall protection, the first time they had changed those regulations since 1994. The third leading cause of fatalities in the workplace is contact with objects. And in fact, from 1999 to 2008, that 10 year stretch, it was the second leading cause. But overall, the second leading cause of workplace fatalities is workplace violence. It has been the second leading cause 13 out of 26 years. And a very close third in 10 of those 26 years. Worse. Workplace violence is the leading cause of workplace fatalities in most years for women. The leading cause of workplace fatalities are transportation incidents. 2017, it was around 40%, and over the years, it has consistently been around 40%. Mostly, it's automotive, but that doesn't count commuting, which the BLS doesn't consider work-related. So, what are the deadly jobs? Well, first let me say, the BLS reports fatality rates in terms of fatalities per 100,000 full-time equivalents. And when you take all jobs in the U.S. into account, public and private, the overall number is 3.5 fatalities per 100,000 full-time equivalents. The deadliest job at 100 is commercial fishing. Commercial fishing has been the deadliest job in seven of the last 12 years. Deadliest catch, indeed. 
The second deadliest job at 84 is logging. And in those years when commercial fishing wasn't the deadliest job, commercial uh, logging was. Given the number of reality shows about logging, that probably comes as no surprise. What usually does come as a surprise, though, is the third deadliest job in America. Aircraft pilot, flight engineer. Wait, what? Isn't flying commercial supposed to be the safest way to travel? It is. But not all pilots are commercial airline pilots. We've got crop dusters, bush pilots, helicopter traffic reporters, life flight pilots. A pilot told me once that crop dusting requires aerobatic moves every few seconds, something that a commercial airline pilot never gets to do. He said, crop dusting is like riding a unicycle balanced on a basketball. You may be able to do it, but at some point you will fall off. And an air ambulance nurse told me once that if we know the patient is going to die if we don't get them to the hospital, we'll take off and fly in conditions other pilots wouldn't consider. The fatality rate for aircraft pilots and flight engineers in 2017 was 49. The fourth deadliest job in America, roofer. In 2017, the fatality rate was 45, and it has pretty consistently been about 40 over all the years that we have data. How do roofers die? Of the six major causes, slips, trips, and falls. The fifth deadliest job is probably a surprise, trash collector. But think about it. Every other job where someone has to work in traffic, there's a flagger out there cautioning people to slow down. Trash collectors don't have flaggers. All they have are annoyed drivers. And think about trash trucks themselves. They're designed to crush organic matter, which includes trash collectors. <laughs> Another surprise for some people is the job that's not one of the deadliest five, or for that matter, one of the deadliest 10, and that's a police officer. Is policing dangerous? Sure it is. Remember, the fatality rate overall is three and a half. Policing is three times more dangerous than that. That makes it a little bit more dangerous than operating mining machinery and not quite as dangerous as being a farm worker. How do police die on the job? If you're thinking workplace violence, homicides, you're right. Workplace violence accounts for almost half of all work-related police fatalities. More than half of work-related police fatalities are the result of traffic accidents. So for all jobs, public and private, workplace violence and traffic incidents account for about 60% of work-related fatalities. But for police, they account for almost all. You know, we can also learn something from safe jobs. The safest job in America is librarian. <laughs> and yet, and yet, even librarians have a fatality rate that is not zero. How do librarians die on the job? Transportation. Librarians drive between library branches. OSHA regulates the conditions that lead to fires and explosions. OSHA regulates the conditions that lead to harmful exposures. It regulates the conditions that lead to slips, trips, and falls, and it regulates the conditions that lead to contact with objects. OSHA does not regulate the conditions that lead to workplace violence and it does not regulate the conditions that lead to transportation incidents. 
every responsible company that I have ever worked with insists that compliance with OSHA regulations is the floor for workplace safety, not the ceiling. Many years ago, I was working on a project for a major multinational chemical corporation. Everybody with an email account got a memo from corporate safety. It said, in the prior year, there had been seven work-related fatalities in the company globally. One related to process safety. The other six were all traffic-related. It went on to say, for those of you working in the area of process safety, continue your work. But for the rest of the corporation, we are reallocating resources and adding new resources to tackle the scourge of traffic incidents because that's where the greatest losses are. That memo had a huge impression on me. Do we know the conditions that lead to workplace violence? We do. Working with the public. Working alone. Poorly lit or secluded workplaces. Working late at night or very early in the morning handling cash, working where drugs are dispensed. Do we know what leads to traffic incidents? We do. The leading cause for traffic incidents is distracted driving. Like drunk driving, distracted driving can be fatal. It took an organization like Mothers Against Drunk Driving to turn the tide of society's expectations against drunk driving. The tide of society's expectations hasn't turned yet against distracted driving. As a society, we expect companies to keep their employees safe from the hazards at work. This is not just fires and explosions, harmful exposures, slips, trips, and falls, contact with objects. It also includes the leading causes, workplace violence and traffic incidents. Can companies do it? I've seen small New England body shops do it. I've seen major multinational chemical companies do it. Every company can and should. But as individuals, as we wait for this tide of society's expectations to turn, what can we do? Well, we can start by not distracting drivers. It used to be, my wife would call me, I'd answer, and she'd say, do you have time to talk? I always said yes. What was I gonna say? Nope, no time for you. <laughs> now, when she calls, she asks, are you driving? If I say yes, she says, talk to you later, and she hangs up. She has an app on her phone that if I call her, it just says, I'm driving now, I'll call you back later. It's important that we not drive distracted, but it's just as important that we not distract others, no matter how important that question about the new policy revision is. When it comes to workplace violence, we can be more aware. We can also make sure that companies know that we expect them to protect their workers from hazards, including workplace violence. Talk to your favorite late night retailer. Make sure that they know that you think having one of their sales clerk working alone late at night is simply unacceptable. But mostly, we can stop overlooking the two greatest hazards that face us in the workplace, workplace violence and transportation incidents. The tide of society's expectations turns one person at a time. Be the next. Be safe.